Good evening, and thank you for coming, which is officially our first lecture in the semester. Um, it is a great pleasure and honor to welcome Mark Wigley. Um, so this probably is among the top three of Tricky's introduction to do for many, many reasons. Um, I know Mark for many, many years. As you all know, architect, writer, theorist, thinker, provocateur, dean, and everything in between. But what make it very, very difficult, I think, to introduce him is Mark has an uncanny capacity to create fictions about things uh, that maybe no one weren't there. And I'll elaborate in a minute. Like Manfredo Tafuri at one point got all us looking back into the Renaissance, or Joseph Kedglas, which probably only two or three of us will know who I'm talking to about a version of me and so on. But what makes it very tricky is because in his 10 years as a dean in Columbia, in the School of Architecture at Columbia University, he did the most extraordinary introductions to the point that I'm absolutely convinced that people went to see introductions more than the lectures, which is not the case today. Uh, and the reason why is because you will listen to those introductions, and then you will see the lecture, and you will say, OK, what Marx said was not really there. So, which, so he has this capacity. So it got me thinking about this old tradition in medieval times. My where these guys would introduce their knights before the fight, right? And they would exaggerate the stories about these guys and so here on. everybody not sitting on a cushion? But the point of that is not so important. What it means by that is there is a construction of architecture, this is a fiction, but one could argue that the construction of the architect or the construction of the writer or the thinker, both are works of fiction. The other thing is Mark has this couple of rules. One is then he choose not to write about living architects, which is one I really like. But I think if you look through it, as he just mentioned to me, it depends what you define by being alive. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. But going back to this idea of fiction, this is a fascinating notion to me because I think more, more than ever, we are in a moment in which we are creating these realities as we see a fit. And these realities, and I always argue that honesty is always incredibly overrated in architecture, these realities that we construct, I think, are absolutely crucial. So I was thinking in this other clip. Jerry, just remember, it's not a lie if you believe it. <laughs> So, jokes aside, it's not a lie if you believe it. And I think it's a, it's a really good line. But jokes aside, what I think is fascinating about to listen Mark to talk and dissect work of art, of architecture, is he created this rea the reality that maybe was there or not. And I think that's one of the most important things that we can learn from him about this. And I think sometimes I think we are doing too good, too good of a job on that. But nevertheless, I think the construction of the project, and the project are many, and the project with words is one of them in which I think Mark is a master of it and one of the best that I know. So without further ado, I really want to welcome Mark Wigley to SIARC. I'm a big fan of Fernand and of this place. Um, and I think it's a great introduction because let's take it as a rule that nothing I'm gonna say is true. Right, just, just like just, just deeply feel that to be the case. Um, not a word, not an image, nothing. All of it, all of it, a kind of fiction. Starting with the technological fiction. Okay, so let's get underway. Um, I, I mean, why am I a fan of Hernan? Because he's not boring, and this place is not boring. But 99.99% .99 of uh, architecture is, and it's not just boring because the people in it are boring. They are 
that's their job, to be boring. In a world that's gone mad and crazy and slippery, architecture still, as it were, positions itself as some kind of uh, anesthetic against everything that's going on. So if, if, you live, if, if you live in a field like architecture, which thinks that it has a relationship to stability and security and so on, you could, you could be in this kind of anesthetic position. So the architect is invited to contribute to society by squeezing some kind of liquid or chemical into the system so people don't realize uh, how, how frightened they are. If this is true, then the people that are most interesting, the ones who uh, maybe they pretend they're using an anesthetic but actually they don't put anything in, so you do the operation with no anesthetic, the anti-anesthetic group are the, are the interesting ones. And of course I think that, and you can hear it in this title, Architecture 101.5, so it's like not Matter Clark 101, it's just a little bit further. Um, but let's say we're gonna be still at the beginning. Uh, or I tell you a story and then you, which is not true, and you have to finish it and finish it in your way or finish it with the, with the pieces that I get. And to do that, we're going to cut Matt Clark like uh, surgically. Maybe we kill him doing that. And you know it's a wee bit tricky because he's famous for, for cutting. So it's really like when you, I mean, it must be what one surgeon feels when doing an operation on another surgeon. It's a bit, it's a bit weird. And don't you think that if you're like a famous surgeon and you were doing an operation on a famous surgeon that you wouldn't like to kind of like give them two aortas or something, um, something like this. So, so you have been warned by, by Hernan and then by me. Uh, an architecture 101.5, cutting Meta Clark. Um, my favorite picture by far of Meta Clark is this one. He's hanging up in a tree in Vassar College, 1971. He's in a kind of cocoon. Uh, you're up in the tree with him, obviously. Uh, he sees you, he's looking right at you, but not quite at you, right? He's just sort of, and, and you, you can decide for yourself what is the look. Is, it, is he imagining that he's been uh, born again? Is it a sly look? Is he nature boy? Like, you have to decide for yourself what it is, but don't for a second think that anything about this image is accidental. He's designed this structure, he's in it, he's organized to be photographed, he's an artist, this is the, a photograph of an artist. My ability to show it to you means that it was carefully taken, carefully chosen, archived and presented in such a way I could show it to you. So this is not at all an accidental image. So if you see him hanging there, sort of suspended in space, looking at you with this strange look, this is the project. This is not a representation or not a kind of working image. It's the actual project. And the word most often used to describe, and if you, like for example, if you don't know what this is on the left, then you can use the word on the right, an architecture. Right? People who don't know what Meta Clark's work is about, they say, well, it's an architecture. People who don't know what an architecture means say, well, you know, Meta Clark. <laughs> so, so the kind of, a, a word that's not so easy to understand is used to explain a person who's not so easy to understand and vice versa. In the end, you don't understand anything, but somehow it's okay, an architecture, Meta Clark. Um, and this word, what kind of word is this? An architecture, right? Uh, it's, it's a funny word. It's, it, it is a self-undoing word. It's a word that undoes itself, right? At first, maybe the first reaction, uh, an architecture must be not architecture, right? Um, but just as you sort of swallowed that thought, then you kind of go, well, wait a minute, but the word an architecture is still kind of there, so it's not not an architecture either, right? So just the first, like, flash of this word is it's not architecture, and it's also not not architecture. Uh, but, but it's not, you know, so it's like an architecture, Right? It just like it could also be just architecture that's like not that important, and it's an architecture, right? Or it's an architecture, like look Rousia, towards an architecture, right? So even the word "an" could be not architecture, or it could be just architecture, or it could be <gasps> the architecture, right? Um, and it's in that word you couldn't help but have, have heard these things. I'm not. I'm just rehearsing what may, maybe went on in your mind. Then of course it has also anarchy is clearly there, right? So now we've got architecture still there. It's, it's not architecture and it's not not architecture. And it could be architecture big or architecture small, but it could also be kind of an anarchy of architecture. It could be architecture really becoming anarchistic, like it's even there, anarchitecture. But if it's an architecture, then it might be not so much architecture heading towards anarchy as anarchy heading towards architecture, right? Like an anarchy would have like an architecture, an architecture, like the structure of anarchy. Or at least it's all of these things, right? 
Um, this is definitely a smell of anarchy in this word, but nothing's really being damaged or dissolved or destroyed, certainly not architecture. Architecture is still hanging around. So this is like everything that you hear when you hear the word and architecture. And by the way, um, this would be a good time to leave the lecture because there may not be anything else to know about it. In other words, th this sort of uh, troubling, you know, like what the hell is an architecture means, this sort of spinning out of control done by this word, which seems kind of compact and architecture, like and precise architecture. After all, architecture is, that is sort of typically stands there and you can point to it. Now I can point to an architecture, but wait a minute, it wouldn't be so easy, right? Because if architecture stands there and you can point to it, but not just stands there, it stands there, it'll still be standing there tomorrow, so I, I really can point to it and point to it again. And architecture m might be an undoing of that. So an architecture might be actually something you can't point to. So if I say an architecture, like, I can't just go, an architecture, right? I can, I can be wanting to point at something and then go, an architecture, and the whole thing about pointing falls apart. Now, you might, again, you might think, well, he's just saying really too much, and please, I wish he, this is an architecture school, we need more pictures, too, much, too, too many words, right? I mean, this is an artist, like, why all this obsession with words, right? But what if this word has in it all of this stuff that I'm talking about? What if it's always like that? And that's actually the full meaning of the word. In other words, that's how it's used. It's used as a sort of like, uh, like when people are cooking, they put things in, right? What if you put the word and architecture in, and this is what happens, a kind of spinning, spiraling uh, 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 effect. Um, surely, at the very least, if we spin through these three meanings, then an architecture is some kind of undoing of traditional thinking about architecture, but it doesn't go so far away from architecture. It's more like architecture becoming something other. So it's still architecture, but becoming something other, and the reverse move. It's like other, something other becoming architecture, a kind of vibration at the limits of architecture, a kind of troubling of the limits. It's the troubling of something thought to be clear. Architecture is always thought to be clear, so an architecture would be sort of a troubling of the clarity of architecture. Um, it's an elusive word, right? Uh, it's it's attract, a very, very attractive word, a very cool word, right? Um, attractive because it's elusive. By the way, it's very contagious, right? You have already been infected, right? That has been my mission so far, just to infect you a little bit with this word. Once you've been infected, you can't resist. By the way, you should resist, right? Because if in architecture is like, not so easy to point to and is a kind of undoing of things, precisely what you shouldn't use this word to do is like as a label. Oh, an architecture. I had, I had an, an architectural lunch today, right? This would be a form of stupidity, but wouldn't it be great to say to your friends that you had an, an architectural lunch, right? So you say it's kind of like a word, you know you shouldn't use it, but you use it, right? And if it's this kind of word that's sort of sexy, high, enticing, but elusive, why do you think that you're the only one that has this problem, right? And that the artist, Matt Clark, he knew how, what he was doing with that word, and the people that write about him, oh, they definitely know. You don't ever for imagine, uh, think that artists and critics and scholars are as kind of screwed up as you are and as confused, right? Which is a mistake, right? Because one of the reasons you might become an artist is to try to figure out why everything seems so strange to you, right? Likewise, as a scholar, in other words, you, you, you should think the opposite, that it's very likely that somebody that operates as an artist or operates as a scholar is in the middle of some extreme mess and they're trying to kind of write their way or draw their way or paint their way or photograph their way into the mess, right? So wouldn't we want to assume that Matt Clark's relationship to this word is not so different from your relationship to it and the people that write about him might have the same kind of relationship? Which, by the way, means that it could well be that 99.99% of the things said about Matt Clark and said about an architecture are profoundly stupid. Like, really stupid. Like, you've got a wonderful word and you just try to kill it. So here's what they do. Okay, this is Matt Clark. This is a Matt Clark project. This is Conical Intersect, 1975. He's drilling a hole through two apartments next to the Pompidou that is about to be demolished. You see him there again. You notice that you see him again as it were, floating, suspended, but not on a tree anymore, or not in a, in a kind of hammock that he's made in the tree, but a kind of hammock that he's invented by carving into this building. I could point to this and say, that's an architecture, because it's a kind of, well, it is still architecture, but it's not architecture as it's normally thought of, and it's not exactly stable. In other words, it, it, I could easily say, yeah, an architecture. Producing this kind of hole, 
You can see it's a kind of cone cut into the building. We're looking up to the cone from the street or looking down to the street through the cone. Uh, it's a kind of vertiginous image, right? A kind of confusion of up or down or inside or outside, of solid and void, of removing and adding. Everything is kind of vibrating. And this is, of course, Metaclark's trick. Um, if we go uh, to Antwerp and we see the Office Baroque, so we just just one, one view of this project, the same thing. We see the architecture that might have been there before he made the cuts, but we also see that the cuts themselves have a kind of geometric precision that maybe even the house didn't have before. So it's not like I take a stable architecture and I cut into it and dissolve its geometry. I actually dissolve the geometry of the building that's there with another geometry that's even more precise. Remember, I forgot to remind you, he's trained as an architect at Cornell. So he's able to play the architect in cutting away at the architecture. And if you were to say, is the architecture in the building revealed by his cut or is it added to the building, one doesn't know. In fact, the image is very, very, and again, I invite you to consider how the image was made and produced, but the effect of the image is to be, uh, again, confusing up and down, inside and outside, solid and void, and so on. We are now in 1977, uh, Office Baroque. And then the last big cut, uh, Circus, 1978 in Chicago. Again, and you can see, of course, some, some as it were, development, some evolution in the work, a, a, a kind of vertigo that's produced, and a kind of suspension Again, a totally carefully orchestrated uh, a refusal to let the solid or the up or the down or the in uh, dominate over the uh, void uh, or the outside uh, uh, and, and so on. So people point to this. I mean, you try, you, you try to just explain it, right? It's interesting for what it is not or for what is just, as it were, fading away in front of you. So if I can just say an architecture, then he would be an, an architect, right? And this is, the, this is, by the way, the standard description of, of, of Matt Clark, that he's, what he does is an architecture and he's an, an architect, right? Um, he supposedly coins the word an architecture in the early 1970s. The first we know of him using the word is 1973. And he used it to name a group of fellow artists that met and had meetings just to talk about the meaning of this word. You thought I was obsessed with this word? This is a group formed around an obsession with this word. They met every week. Each meeting would last the length of one bottle of tequila. And when the tequila was finished, they would go and do other things. But during the, the meeting, they would be discussing what could an architecture mean. They eventually do an exhibition in March of 1974 called An Architecture at 112 Green Street in their downtown neighborhood what would be now thought of as uh, Soho uh, in, in Manhattan. Of course, the story is a bit more complicated. Did, did Matt Clark know about Dubuffet's portfolio of 10 prints from 1959 called uh, the, Anar the, the An Architect, right? And in fact, if you know a little bit about Matt Clark's work, you have to see some of the things that Dubuffet is dealing with in these prints is similar to things that were very important for Matt Clark. He was extremely well read. Would he have read Robin Evans writing an essay called Towards an Architecture in 1970? Of course, a play on Le Corbusier's Towards an Architecture. So again, the very expression towards an architecture meant to be the kind of heroic establishment of a new architecture to organize a modern society might also be the way to announce its opposite. Did he know uh, Gianni Pettina's book, L'Architecto Architecto of 1973, which has the subtitle Portrait of the Artist as a Young Architect, exactly which could be a description of Matt Clark himself somebody who's an artist who was, in his youth, an architect. We know that he knew about the book on the right. He was very nervous about this book on the right. And when he finally got hold of a copy, he was able to write back to his colleagues in the in architecture group and say, it's OK. He just uses the word on the cover, and he never uses it on the inside of the book, and nothing on the inside of the book uh, uh, is, is useful. If we think again about the kinds of words that, uh, uh, that he was using, and architecture is similar to other words that he's using from 1971 on, like unbuilding. He always would say that he was unbuilding uh, these projects. Or he would say he was destructuring them, or defunctionalizing them, or undoing them. So a series of words that sound very similar. Or other words he used like restructuring, reorganizing, retranslating, redefining, and rethinking. All these kinds of, it's, it's somehow related to all of this. And yet, an architecture had a very specific resonance for him. He was endlessly fascinated. Uh, remember, none of this is true. So I'm just saying he was maybe this fictional character, endlessly fascinated 
with what this word in architecture might be. For him, it was first and foremost a question, like what is an architecture? That's what an architecture is, and that's why you needed a group to discuss it, right? So it's a word that doesn't describe a thing or an action or a quality, but it's a question that mobilizes debate, mobilizes discussion. It's a kind of multiplier. It's not a pinning down of things, but a kind of uh, 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 multiplier. Now, of course, if you then say that he's an, an architect, you're trying to pin it down, you try to pin him down. So despite the fact that for him an architecture is a question and a destabilizing, uh, in fact this is an exhibition on the left in Los Angeles at the MAC, works an architecture, an, another exhibition in, in, uh, in Chile, exhibition in, in uh, Frankfurt, and an exhibition that will open in one month in New York, called Matter Clark, an architect. In fact, if people write about Matter Clark, and let's say they only have two sentences to write, the word in architecture is extremely likely to be in those two sentences. The typical form of it is Gordon Matter Clark, whose work he described as an architecture, or Gordon Matter Clark, an architecture, his word for it. Right? So there's actually, I can show you 100 examples of writers using the expression, his word for it. It's a bit like saying, I might use a different word, or he was, I'm not sure what he was on, or I'm not sure what he meant. Right? But the naming, the, the kind of voicing of the word, Matt Clark's use of the word is being, is being kind of uh, uh, cited. So, there, so this is a sort of a standard portrait. Now the standard portrait of Matt Clark, the architect, is also the portrait of somebody sweaty, uh, disobedient, a risk taker, a sub subversive figure, uh, uh, da danger. Uh, I would suggest to you that if you look closely at all of the work of Matt Clark, this is his uh, hair project. And by the way, look at his face. He's anyway looking at you. And he's wanting you to look at him. He's waited for you to look. This photograph has been taken so that you will see him look. And look at his look. He's looking directly at you. It's not the image of a madman. Quite the opposite, right? He looks at you back with such precision. His hair has been actually classified with such precision. So this very image of Matt Clark, the kind of crazy guy, is actually Matt Clark, the scientist, Meta Clark is, if anything, one of the most systematic, most focused, most precise of artists, I would suggest, and somebody with a very, very clear intellectual project for all of the uh, much advertised uh, uh, danger. And this highly focused, this highly uh, intellectual, highly thoughtful figure uh, of Meta Clark, this, this, this figure is not the one you will normally hear about because people want to think of those projects as, again, they, the, the, the sense of anarchy is the, one, is, the, is the one that they are drawn to, not the sense of architecture. And this is especially the case of the An Architecture group. Uh, by the way, what was the group? Uh, none of the members of the group agree upon what the group was, who was in it, where they met, and how often or why. And the An Architecture exhibition, not one of the people in it uh, has the same memory of it in any detail. Um, there were no reviews of the exhibition and no eyewitness accounts. We actually have no evidence that this exhibition took place. And by the way, this exhibition is so mythical. Because if you have only one paragraph, you say, Gordon Matter Clark, and architecture is what he, his word for it. And if you have two paragraphs, you say, and he organized a group to talk about this in the 70s. And that group included Laurie Anderson, Richard Nonas, etc. You, you get into this kind of spin. The fact that nobody knows about whether this exhibition, I mean, they think it happened, but there's no evidence that it actually happened. The fact that there is no evidence has just made it just get larger and larger and larger. Um, it's a bit like what you were saying. Right? When you actually hear the lecture, you go like, oh. But if you don't hear ever about the lecture, if you never get to see what the show is, it just looms as this amazing moment uh, uh, in late 1973, early 1974. We have only three pieces of evidence that the show took place. On the left, in Avalanche is an announcement in the kind of gossip section that an architecture, a group effort by Tina Gerard, Susie Harris, Richard Nonis, and Gordon Matter Clark, a catalog of their neither art nor architectural living spaces will be shown late this winter. So it's an announcement of an exhibition, but what kind of exhibition exactly? Well, it's a catalog. What do you mean it's a catalog? Is it a, is it a book or is it a, like, is it a show that's like a book? But anyway, it's neither art nor architecture, great. Uh, but it's living spaces, so it's living spaces, spaces you could live in, but they're not art or ar architecture. Okay. By the way, it then goes on to say that Gordon Matter Clark is doing amazing stuff in Italy at the same time. So it's a group effort, everything is kind of collaborative, but there's a real great person in that group, like, that's our guy. 
Then you go to the invitation. So, and by the way, just to sort of zoom in on it, that invitation is in the middle of this page here, which is the same page that announces the death of Robert Smithson and the birth of the two twins of uh, Rachel and Jeffrey Liu, who are the people who run the 112 Green Street place where this will happen. So this is downtown gossip, right? And you see it there on the right. Here is the invitation card. We see the word in architecture on a tablecloth. Um, again, it's anarchy texture, but then on the photograph, they've then put group, and then 112 Green Street March. So actually, there, it gives us at least four possible titles for the show. It could be the An Architecture Show, done by the group, or it could be the An Architecture Group Show, or it could be the An Architecture Show, or the An Architecture Group Show by the group, right? And, and you have no idea, right? Uh, in fact, the way it's uh, structured is kind of encouraging you to, to wonder about it. Something a little bit domestic about it, right? It's a table, tablecloth, and so on, and there's nobody else sitting there. So it's some kind of hospitality. So, so there's going to be this exhibition of non-art or architectural living spaces from this group, not exactly sure what the name of it is, um, in, in this space, right? Then the, the fourth thing we have is this spread in flash art in June of 1974, so that, that is to say, a few months after the exhibition appears this, and it says, an architecture on the left, and then says that there is a group, and now the group is eight people rather than uh, four, so uh, Laurie Anderson, uh, Bernie Kirschenbaum, uh, Gene Heistein, and Dickie Landry have been added, and there's a little text uh, saying, an architecture. Oh, so the word is pulled apart again immediately, an architecture, and then it gets pulled apart. This show was comprised of a collection of photographic notes, up to you to describe what they mean, evolving from a year of group discussion around mental, personal, and structural or architectural notions of space or place. So there it is, nicely uh, stated for you. Um, and there is, a, let's say, a spread, a mosaic of images, but they don't tell you whether those images were in the show or whether this is a single image or multiple images, you're, you're left to, think, to sort of uh, think about it. And, and the first of those images, you see the top left, the first of those images involves taking the word in architecture and splitting it up 33 times, right? Just in case you think I'm the one with the kind of word problem. This is, so this word, this word in architecture, is not only a, a kind of exploding word, but it's a word that has to be exploded or explodes itself on the pages of this. You still have no idea what's in that exhibition, but it's already happened and is being promoted in flash art uh, in, in this kind of elusive uh, way. So how does it happen that this non-exhibition that nobody ever saw and the people that were in it don't remember, and you know eyewitnesses always see murders differently. In this case, there's just not a single thing they agree on. They will say things like, yeah, it was a row of photographs. And if you say, was it on one wall? They say, no, it was on two walls. And the other person says, no, 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 no. And it goes on and on like this. Um, all of these people were serial photographers. All of them photographed almost everything they did. They rarely went to have a shit without photographing it. Right? This is the age of documentary art. So they all together, all of these documentary artists, do an exhibition without documenting it. Right? So it was either a really amazing exhibition that kind of defeated uh, representation, or it was actually kind of a shitty show that was not worth documenting. Now, the standard view that mo of most of the group uh, is it was not a very good show. <laughs> uh, we didn't even bother. But some of the groups say, not only was it a great show, it was the show that represents the whole downtown scene. And what is uh, agreed upon is, it's the show that killed the group and killed the scene of 112 Green Street where it was shown. In other words, you either think it was the best show ever or the worst show ever, but either way it was a deadly, lethal, right? A killer. But we still don't have any idea about it. And we certainly don't know how do we get from this show that we don't have any evidence for to Matta Clark, the an architect, doing this kind of big physical stuff. Well, the scene of the crime is this. Art Right, which is a very small artist publication, usually given away for free downtown, which presents here, uh, 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 as you can see, an architecture in Englewood, Englewood, New Jersey suburb. And you see a house that has been uh, split looking at it more closely. You see it's been split right down the middle. In fact, Matt Clark made two slots one inch apart and then leaned one side of the house down so it goes back. You see that this, the cut actually goes right through the upper window. So of course the pane of glass has broken in that window. But otherwise, it weirdly looks like maybe the house is still being lived in. 
Right? It's got a we- kind of an uncanny effect. And this uncanniness is multiplied by the fact that the house seems to fit the photographic frame perfectly. It's like it's designed to be photographed. And it's so ridiculously symmetrical. Right? But you know what's really uncanny about the image is that the house, it's not the image of a house being cut. Because you never would have seen this house. This is a house of an African-American family that was kicked out in order that this place could be knocked down, in fact, replaced by a car park, in a neighborhood, a working-class neighborhood, that you or I would never have visited. So this house only exists as a house for you because it was cut and then it was photographed, and then I can show you the photograph. So this is not the death of the house, but the kind of birth of a house, or at least this is an, an artwork that made this house a permanent house. Like a, and what kind of house is it? Well, it's like kind of house that a child would draw. It's like a housey house. It's like a home sweet home. But the whole point is, of course, that the way he's cutting it and the uncanniness of it is this thing coming apart or going together is to suggest that actually home sweet home was never so sweet at all, right? Uh, uh, that actually the uh, houses are made up of unkind cuts, right? Um, maybe. Now, what happens in the, in the spread of art, right? You see that that image is placed on the top left. So you, as it were, when you read the magazine, you arrive at the house. You kind of arrive outside it, and, then, and, then down, and, and it's as if an architecture in Englewood, first of all, reads as the caption to the image. Oh, so that's an architecture. And you may say to yourself, well, okay, I see it's a house that's been cut, but then what the hell is an architecture? I better read. So you go down below to the three columns, which are perfectly symmetrically organized in the same plane of the house. And what it says there is that a group of artists left Soho in a bus and visited the house. And when you're inside the house, it was full of emotional tra- uh, tragedy and co- complexity and weirdness because it was very, all your sense of orientation and bearings and emotions was disturbed by the house. So it says basically the house is a piece of sculpture, that it's a physical thing, and that when you're in it, your, your sense of home and house and everything is disturbed. But it's not so simple. Because the spread itself has been split. You see it, right? There's a split running down the middle. And on the right is a second article on the house called Take Two, like a second take, second version, written by Laurie Anderson. And you get two new images. Now we're inside looking at one of the rooms that's been split, right? And what's important about the photograph is the room is still a room. It's, it's, it's more like a room that has a scar in it than a room that's being pulled apart. In fact, of course, it gets wider as it gets above. But there's this weird quality that the light coming in is, is a V coming down and the cut is a V going up. So it's a kind of self-lit cut, right? At the bottom it looks like a scar and at the top it looks like a seam and it's kind of glowing. So you have a room that's still, I mean, is this, is this cut holding the room together or is it the room falling apart? Is it like galvanizing the room or letting it go? It's kind of both at the same time. So this sort of self-lit, this kind of self-theatrical scar um, uh, is the first image we see. And down below is the image of a corner of, of a, top, a top corner of the building that's been removed. And of course, since the corner has been removed, you might say to yourself, well, the corner has gone. But actually, the corner still feels more like a corner than ever before. It's kind of like a super corner. So if I, if I have a corner of a building, Meta Clark says, basically, if I remove the corner, it's more like a corner than it was before. This is a, this is a corner. Right? Precisely because you don't see the corner where it normally is, you mentally put it in there, so actually it is a, it's like a hyper corner. And what does is, what is Laurie Anderson argue? She makes this, and of course she's uh, you know, beyond genius, b- beautiful thinker and writer. She says, actually, he's not cutting the house. He made a line, he drew a line, and then put bits of the house to hold that line in place. So she's, if the first reader first writer says, this is a physical work, it's a work of sculpture, you have to be there to feel it in your body, and it's all about disorientation. She's saying, no, it's kind of the, exactly the opposite, it's a conceptual work, and it's all about drawing the thinnest of lines using the heaviest of materials to hold this uh, in place. Either way, this house in Englewood is stamped as an architecture. Now, this is pretty amazing, because he started working on this house during the time of this mythical exhibition of an architecture. In other words, just a few months before this house was visited by these artists, it, there was the maybe, maybe not exhibition, which included Laurie Anderson herself, and she says, uh, this is Matta Clark's word for it. She's already using this expression. That's his word for it. She's like, I don't know. Don't talk to me about the architecture group. I don't know anything about them. So we have this amazing thing where the world's least visible exhibition, uh, a word from that is used to to describe this house, which as you know is one of the 
artworks of the, of the 20th century. If you're being trained in art now, this is just going to hit you again and again and again. This is one of the canonic works uh, of 20th century art. So one of the most visible, the most highly celebrated works of art is named with a word that was coming from an exhibition which is the least visible exhibition in history, and it's like one month apart. And nobody's going like, oh, wait a minute, uh, what's the connection? Okay, the, you could say, but that's just art, right? You know, it's like a little downtown magazine, one artist writing about another to another. But then it goes to art in America. Well, it's another artist, El Brunel, writes The Great Divide and Architecture in quotation marks, right? Like what Matt Clark says, we get a few more images. We're starting to see a little bit more inside the house. We're, a kind of portrait of the house is building up. And what does Brunel said? He says the Englewood House is the latest in a series of spatial transformation, which Matt Clark calls an architecture. And then in parenthesis, he once studied to be an architect. Actually, it's so quietly written <laughs> that you're not even sure if Brunel was aware that he was saying it. I mean, I think he, he just wants to say he really is an architect, but he just has, has sort of, because otherwise he would have put it in quotation marks. He was trained to be an architect, right? Look at how smart I am. I don't think he's so smart. I think it's just the unconscious. The un well, he's probably smart, but in this moment, the unconscious just let it say an architect. So it's just very, very complicated. It's the latest in a series of, okay, spatial transformations. That's something, right? This is spatial transformation, as if we know what that is. Um, by the way, you're all architects, right? So surely you know what spatial transformation is, um, which Matt Clark calls an architecture in quotation marks. It's interesting, because if you use the expression calls, you don't need quotation marks. Quotation marks is like a really kind of, uh, uh, and then once he's, he tried to be an architect. So, okay, that suggests that this house that has been split is a work of an architecture, and that's not because anything to do with the show that happened a few weeks before, which is not mentioned, but it's to do with a longer trajectory within Matta Clark's work, like something that preceded the show. And sure enough, of course, Matta Clark was, um, particularly in the middle of 1972, going into unused buildings or abandoned buildings in the Bronx, uh, in uh, Brooklyn, and in Manhattan, and he was carving into buildings. And the first thing he would do was just take a, a rectangular piece of the floor or the wall. And then he started to get more tricky. This is Warhol. And, he, he, you know, for sure, uh, Andy Warhol is a very big reference for Matt Clark. So walls, this wall hole, is, there's no doubt who he's referring to. And he cuts through the door and through the corner. This has the effect. And, of course, he's cutting through more or less at, the, at your height. We stand there looking through the room. But we look through the room to see the windows on the other side, which now maybe you see them as cuts. In other words, he makes cuts that reveal the cuts that are already there. I am now in a room experiencing the next room, but also experiencing the space beyond it, and the walls no longer uh, restrict that ability. And even the mechanism, the door, which would allow or not allow, has been, as it were, cut. So he's getting trickier and trickier. Then he does this one, so-called Bronx floors. You can see he's cut again a rectangle near a wall, but then he's taken a piece of the wall out, which is attached to a door to produce a kind of L-shaped hole in the door, and he's photographed it from every angle, from below, now we're down here below, looking up, and then from the side. Now what's amazing about this image is not only by making these cuts have all the spaces that are normally separated been linked, so we're, here we're upstairs and we are in a continuous space, it's become like a loft, um, but also we are now perfectly looking into the spaces below, and in reverse we see from below. So the original architecture which divides one floor from another or one room from another is no longer working, he's kind of depowered the mechanisms of the walls and the floors, uh, and produced a kind of indeterminate space. But more precisely, if you look at the top image and just try to look at it differently, what the image really is of a, is of a very clearly defined dark hole on the on there, a vertical dark hole, an L-shaped hole looking towards another regular hole. In other words, it's a kind of galaxy of holes and then whatever architecture is, it's just sort of lurking around that galaxy. In other words, he's not, he's destabilizing the building, but by kind of stabilizing certain geometries which are now floating. You see it also in the right-hand image. There's just a series of these rectangular figures which are now suspended in space. So he's, he's, he's doing something about suspension. Now, he exhibits these uh, cuts uh, for the first time in October of 1972 at 112 Green Street in this exhibition. We see big cut, uh, uh, a series of cuts. Um, if we take the uh, first cut, it seems very simple. There's a kind of rectangle that's been cut out. On the wall is a photograph of the hole where the cut came from. So you're kind of encouraged to, as it were, reinsert. You can just see how you would reinsert the piece into the wall, but it's more complicated. 
He's printed the prints large. In fact, the size of the print on the wall starts to approximate the size of the object. So in a certain sense, the, the photograph is acting as kind of proof that the thing really happened, but also the thing itself is acting as proof. Also, the photograph stops you from reading the thing on the floor as a piece of minimalist sculpture, which would have been the dominant reception of it at that time. Both of them kind of undo each other, and they kind of vibrate. And anyway, and I know you don't believe me, but let me try. When I put a big black photograph on a wall, through which you see a cut in a wall, sim simply putting the photograph on the wall is like putting a hole in the wall, right? Because basically he's made a window on the wall through which you can see another space in which that has been cut. So when you mentally say, I can insert the white piece into the white hole, you are inserting it into a hole which is inside another hole which is inside another hole. And you might say, no, come on. Was he drinking before the lecture? I mean, it's just a piece of wall and a photograph of the hole that it came out from, and it's not nearly as tricky as he says. Okay. Maybe you're right. Let's look at this one. This is Warhol again. That's that horizontal cut. It's up on a table. So actually, it's kind of up at the same height it was when it was cut, which also stops it from being like a piece of sculpture and more like a piece of evidence. Like, and then on the, on the wall behind, we have a photograph showing the hole that it was removed from. Um, and actually, from this view and in this photograph, they have the same size. Again, it's a pretty big... It's two prints that have been put together. So mentally, you can insert the piece into the hole. The proportion of the piece has the same as the proportion of the hole in the photograph. But more than that, it's the same as the proportion of the prints in which you see the hole. And by the way, if you look closely, it's not a photograph of the original hole. The two photographs don't line up. He's made a fantasy hole. So basically, you're led to think, like, there's the hole and there's the object, and I can put my object in the hole, but actually the hole wasn't there was like a wiggly lecture. It's a total fantasy, uh, right? You remember that, so we're looking again. You see you appear to be looking through a hole and through across a room where you see a window. In fact, in that room, there were two vertical windows. The sense that there's a horizontal hole is produced by the trick of the photograph, right? So my, you might at this point say, oh, maybe Wiggly has a point. He's been tricky. This guy has been very tricky. I don't know what to trust. A photograph is, is not a fact and nor is the object effect. Let's try this one. You have a piece of floor sitting on the floor, right? But it's standing up. So we see on one side there's carpet, so that would have been upstairs, and then we have the battens that would have held the plaster, and we look up at a photograph of a diamond-shaped cut that seems to match the diamond, and we can see how it goes in. Even we can see the beams that are holding the two slices in the photograph above. But if you pay half attention to the photograph above, it's a fantasy hole. There is no such hole. He's actually taken four photographs and assembled them in a different order to create a kind of a fictional hole. But you're kind of led to believe that it could be done. And on the right, he does another one again. So just in case you're idiot enough to think it's actually a photograph of a hole, he puts another one alongside to say, watch out, maybe I'm a photographer, not a sculptor. Right? So he's being tricky. And then to the right again, you see, this is what we were looking at before. You see to the right, there's another two prints hanging up. Actually, it's made of layered prints. It appears to be one image of a building, but it's actually produced by 10 prints. Very tricky. Nobody gives a shit about these photographs, by the way. What they talk about is this wall, which is the, on the opposite side. Right? This wall is a series of newsprints on which he's very much under the influence of Warhol, printed in color, black and white photographs of the exposed facades of buildings that have fallen down. So he's made a wall out of walls. He calls it walls paper. Right? And it's smart, and it's tricky, definitely. Right? Then he folds the newspapers up, and for $3, by the way, oh, that we could buy it for $3, sitting on the floor. Nobody did, by the way. They just sat there for the whole exhibition like this. So then he took the poster image for the exhibition, this one. Again, it shows you a building with, it, with the exposure. You see that he's photographing buildings in which the inside has been exposed to the outside, and now he's putting them back on the inside. So he puts the inside wall that's being exposed to the outside on the inside of an art gallery. That's what he means. Walls upon walls upon walls. Tricky guy. Right? Not this crazy uh, tequila drinking guy, or people who drink a lot of tequila are not so crazy. Right? He takes this image, and he makes that the cover of a book, because he's got all these newsprints that nobody bought, and he folds the newsprints up inside, and he wraps them around, and, and so it's a book, it's an artist's book, but he also splits it. You see the book has been split. 
So depending on how you open it, you get a continually, it's a bit like a commercial sort of wallpaper sample book, and it is a sample of wallpapers as far as he's concerned, the Walls paper book, but it's a kind of a complex work in which you could, you could every now and then reassemble one of the images that he's originally taken. Then he takes the same book and cuts that in half, like right in the middle, and makes another book to give to his friends. Another, and so and at this point you would say, okay, slow down. He's being an artist here. This is an artist's book, no doubt about it. Like some of these pages are cut and wrinkled and so on. And you might say, got him. I mean, okay, so maybe Matt Clark has like, he's a sort of photo documentary guy at one end, making physical cuts, and he's a kind of artist artist at the other end, and he's being a little bit tricky because he's putting all sorts of stuff in the middle as well. So you become unsure where to place him, and I think that's right. Let me give you two examples. This on the left is, is that photograph of the whole of food, right? That's the simplest of the cuts, 1971. It's just a hole in the wall, square hole. This is the photograph of it. Of course, this is not a simple photograph. This is a, re this is a, a two, pr two prints have been made from one negative to produce this big image. So this is actually the photograph that was used in the 1972 exhibition. But when people talk about it, they never say, this is a, a, an artwork or a photo work done for a 1972 exhibition. They say, this is a cut from 1972. In other words, when people talk about that image on the left, they think of it as a photograph of a cut. They don't think of it as a photographic cut. They're not interested in the cuts used to frame the image. They're not used to the cut of the original camera. They're not, they're not interested in the medium of cutting, the medium of photography, only the thing itself. On the other hand, this thing on the right called pipes from the same year, everybody says, this is the moment where he confuses photography and sculpture because you've got photographs of pipes that have been placed in a cut in a wall, and on the wall, and out of the wall, and one of the pipes that's actually in the wall has been exposed by the cut. So it's kind of like a polemical confusion of what is a real pipe and what is an image of a pipe. And everybody says of the image on the right, that's art, right? And that's the breakthrough moment. Of course, what they never point out is that image on the right is actually a photograph of a 1987 reconstruction of the pipe. So they don't say in the caption, photograph of reconstruction of the original pipe's work. They say that's the pipe's work. In other words, that's a fake pipe that is actually put in the wall to make this photograph. So this image on the left, which is the actual photograph of an exhibition, and the one on the right, which is a restaging, retrospective, 10 years after the death of Matt Clark. The one on the right is treated as art and the one on the left is treated as docu documentation. Why am I saying that? Because Matt Clark's work profoundly confuses experts in documentary photography. In other words, they, the very people that are wanting to discuss the nature of documentary photography and the slippage between what is a photograph, what is an artwork, and what is a document, get tricked endlessly by, by Matt Clark. Nobody's interested. This is Matt Clark making that exhibition. We see him in the distance, and you could already ask yourself, how, how come he's being photographed while making it and all of that stuff? But more importantly, I think this is a very radical, uh, subversive exhibition of 72, but nobody's particularly interested in the subversiveness of the installation. They are interested in the, in the uh, Walls paper uh, uh, on the right. Matt Clark is sufficiently in, uh, kind of energized by this experience that he starts to do much more uh, kind of acupunctural. He, he figures out in any building what is the minimum cut he can make which produces the maximum confusion of space. So, for example, if you cut a square out of the threshold of a door, you get this kind of uh, complication. And then he will make a book in which he puts the photograph of that, and then he cuts into the book. So he's actually doing to the paper what he did to the cut. And you might say, okay, this is... He's making a performance, it's a physical performance, and then it's photographed, it's photographed in a kind of a canny way, it's photographed in a documentary way also. We see it before it's cut, when it's cut, and after it's cut. And now it's definitely, he's being an artist again. So once again, a kind of layered movement from, from kind of documentation. He does it again with this one, doors above, floors below. What if I cut a hole where two doors meet at right angles, and, and the plan below has a different geometry? I get this kind of project, and I can produce this kind of book, and so on and so on. In his own apartment, he takes hold of one doorway and produces this, Cooper's Cut. Right? He's just be getting unbelievably good at just surgically uh, 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 sending architecture, sort of spinning in a million directions. What if I just took a corner and cut a rectangle out of each wall that meets at a corner? This is what would start to happen. Right? This would be the sort of uh, 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 complications. What's interesting about a school like SIAC, SIAC sort of begins with the idea, this is, would be sort of a minimum amount of complexity with which a project should be done. In other words, instead of taking a box 
and then kind of bringing it to life. Now we, now we in architecture are, are, are much more familiar with starting with a kind of unstable geometry and, and, and working from there. But at this moment, it's, it's pretty radical. Then he does this one. Notice that we start to see him doing the cutting. So we, the performance nature, the equipment that's being used, the hole that's being cut, really canny. It's just a square hole, but it's next to a wall, matches the wall, with two windows slightly at angles so that you get these kinds of views. So we're upstairs looking down through the hole. We see somebody walking through the street. So a hole through a hole through a hole. What Matterclark is interested in is not the cuts themselves, but the way your eye can cut through the space as a result of what he does. He's interested in that, that kind of cut. And look at the way he's photographing it, picking it up on all the different things that are exposed, all the layers, all the history, and all the politics of the situation. And even the weirdness, that the strange feeling that the ceiling of one floor gets kind of collaged into the ceiling of the floor above. And again, very, very carefully uh, uh, taken pictures. He goes to Italy and he discovers that he could take a, one concrete wall meets another concrete wall and if I make a triangular cut, every face of the wall will be different and every face will be complicated. He even figures out a kind of documentary way to show it, the building before you cut and the sequence of the cuts. He's insisting on the documentary nature of these, photogra of these photographs and by the way, that's absolutely the case with Matt Clark. He never ever lets go of the idea of documentary photography. He insists, he insists, he insists. Um, uh, he, did, he did, comes up with what he calls a documentary system for classifying and showing the work. There's the one that we've just seen. And then finally, um, in the middle of 1973, from the middle of 1973 to 74, he gets to cut houses. So here we have a whole house on the left in Genoa. We have the house in Englewood that you have seen, and we have Bingo in, in Niagara. Um, 1971 to 1978 are the cuts. 1974 of the house in the middle is exactly halfway through the cuts. If you want to understand Matter Clark, you have to understand the cuts. If you want to understand the cuts, you have to understand that house in the middle. If you want to understand that house in the middle, you have to understand an architecture. An architecture is the key that unlocks all of Matter Clark. Matter Clark does a huge amount of work that's dealing with kind of composting and dance and uh, dreams and, and alchemy. Uh, and drawing, and, and, and all, in all of these areas, if you look at his work, you he could be celebrated as a fantastically interesting artist. But in my opinion, he would never have been celebrated if it wasn't for this key, this door, that o slowly opened his work. Um, and is that work called an architecture? Definitely. So here's the A-hole house. This is an article by Germano Chalant, uh, Gautamata Clark, Architecture of the Ready-Made. Matter Clark's godfather is Duchamp, by the way, so no accidents here. You see the roof being cut at the top, you see the sideways move, and he says, the memory of the concreteness and the space within the interior emerges. Architecture becomes an architecture, da-da, right? So the house before splitting is an architecture, pointed to. We know uh, Englewood is called an architecture, and immediately later, Lucy Lippard will describe Bingo, the house that comes afterwards, as an architecture. So in 1974, everybody's agreed, it's an architecture. By the way, if you look at the article of uh, Chalant, he, he quotes Matta Clark. You see that long quote there? This long quote, which is coming from the brochure of the exhibition, is probably Matta Clark's first attempt to theorize his cuts. If you read it, it's unbelievably tricky. Um, but it builds up to the final line, the whole house works to receive an intrusion. In other words, the house only becomes a house with a cut, but the house is only a house to the extent that invites the cut. The cut is not made, let's say, from the outside, but from the inside. Anybody who reads this text knows to be careful with Matt Clark, that he doesn't muck around. This is a serious uh, 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 thinker. He's thinking like an architect, right? He's thinking that anything I do with the space is not just like a concept or a representation of concept, but it is a concept, it is a mode of thought. He draws it like an architect, that's the project. Here it is sliced. Again, you can see it's a kind of development of the, of the war hole. And he cuts it this way. Then he exhibits it using a, a variety of the strategy that he used. You see the, the fragments that's on the floor. A cut drawing is up on, the, on one wall, and on opposite sides, for the first time, he produces what he calls photo assemblages. So he's taken images of the cut, and he's done something very like Laurie Anderson said. He's preserved in the photographs the line of the cut. He shows it, by the way, on the wall, more or less at the same height that it was when it was cut, so you have more or less the same kind of experience, but what you experience is something that you could not have experienced uh, in, in the house uh, uh, itself. He shows also at the same time in that exhibition in Genoa, houses like this, cuts like this, piers in and out, 
but he's never mentioning an architecture, right? So everybody's saying, an architecture, rules, that's great, amazing. And he's never using the word. In fact, he was interviewed in this house by Liza Bear, uh, like two days after the bus tour, which everybody visited it. Um, and she then eventually in December publishes this article in Avalanche, in which you see now we're starting to see the house in much more detail. We see it from below and above, from the sides. We, we have for the first time an image of him cutting the house and what does he say? He's asked straightforwardly the question, do you see the Humphrey Street building as a piece of architecture? Answer, no. Right? So basically for one year, 1974, everybody that was trying to promote him says, an architecture. And then he's asked, uh, <clears throat> what do you think? No. Right? Um, and he's saying that in the house, so it's kind of like uh, super important. What does he say afterwards? No, our thinking about an architecture was more elusive than doing pieces that would demonstrate an alternative attitude to buildings, or rather to attitudes to determine. In other words, what I'm doing with the house is dealing with containerization and the boxing in of people, and what we were doing was more elusive. And he talks about the show. The show that we did last year, well, actually, that's not right, because it was the same year, it was actually just one. In other words, he's doing this interview one month after the show, and he says, we did it last year. And she, who's intervi interviewing Liza Bear, who is the one that advertised the show in Avalanche, doesn't say, no, no, you mean this year. And when they do all the endless edits, they don't change this. So this is another kind of a weirdness. Again, unlikely that the show really happened, but they, they, he says it was not very well expressed, but we're not going to use something other than the established architectural vocabulary. He goes on, she says earlier, uh, I've always thought of you as working in architectural context. He says, no, not architectural in the strict sense. You know, everything that I'm showing you here are some of the most famous quotes of Matta Clark. It's really hard to find an article about Matta Clark that doesn't quote the beginning of this section. Now, they never quote the moment where he says, it's not an architecture. So they basically take the first part of this paragraph and the second part, and they just remove that sentence. Sometimes they put three dots, but when they're really courageous, they just throw the dots away. Right? Nobody wants to touch this. Nobody has ever referred to the fact that he said it was not architecture. And he goes on, we were looking for something more environment, we wanted to do something with voids and gaps, also very famous. Right? If you were to take these words out of the writing about Matta Clark, Matta Clark's writing would be full of holes, like totally perforated. People don't want to hear that this is not an architecture. Right? It's worse than this. Uh, when the, when the article is published in Avalanche in December 1904, the house itself had just been exhibited in this house at the John Gibson Gallery under the title of a series of partially total buildings. And a piece of bingo is put in the, in the, in the gallery. This is the gallery. Now we see it from behind. You will see that the corners of the house, which is now called Splitting, and it's in this exhibition that for the first time it's announced that the title of the house is Splitting. And you see that the four corners have been placed in the gallery as if the house is kind of coming up from below. They're re-established. They re so again, typical of Matta Clark, he's making you treat, treat it as a, a kind of real piece of architecture with its original geometry, but also asking you to kind of think about how weird to find it in a gallery. But then you go into the next gallery, there's a picture of one of the corners being removed from the house, and then on the floor he's made a cut photograph. So he basically takes you from a photograph of the corner being removed to the actual corner to another photograph of the corner being removed to a photograph. He's just slyly sliding you backwards and forwards between the object and the photograph to make these kinds of uh, cuts. Very tricky. Deep, deep cuts into the drawing. By the way, he got physically injured making the exhibition, like radically injured. And when he was doing the actual cutting of the house, which everybody says is so dangerous, no injuries. Right? So making an exhibition, dangerous physical activity. Uh, making the actual cuts, not. He also releases this book, $3.50, called Splitting. White, we see, I'm, I'm just showing you all the pages very quickly. You get four stages of the house, finding the house, cutting the slice, leaning one half of the house back, removing the corners. Each time he shows you like a mugshot, you know, it's almost like a medical survey, front, back, and sides, and then a series of collages of each step. Right? And if you look at the collages, of course you could say this is very much, in this, again, the spirit of Laurie Anderson, that he follows the line of the cut. So it's kind of as if he has figured out a way of representing the cut so that the movement of your head or the movement of your body is somehow compacted. And when he shows at the end the corners of the house, he, your head doesn't have to move. It's just in the corner, so he doesn't do any collars. But, it's not, but look at it. He's cut the photograph with the same shape as the hole that has been removed from the corner. You see the image on the right? The exact proportions of the 
print are the same as the hole that's been removed. So once again, he's playing with you. He's allowing you to think not only are you looking at the image of a fragment that has been moved, but you think that you're looking at a fragment of the photograph which has that fragment inside of it. You kind of disappear into these layers of holes. And then finally he finishes the book with a kind of uh, magisterial collage where he reassembles the house almost like a forensic image in which you only see the inside surfaces of every room and precisely what's been removed from the image, the gap between the photographs, is where the structure would be. So he's kind of eviscerated the body. It's like removing all of the uh, spine and structure and leaving only the kind of organs in this kind of forensic image. But it's also an image that it's kind of put the house upright again, right? And this image is the image, by the way. For those of you you know, this is Metaclark 101.5, so for those of you looking to publish Metaclark, you have to have this image. I've told you which images you have to use, which quotes you have to make, you have to have this one, right? Maybe you want to have the book that he cuts, that has the same cuts, which has the same fold out at the end. Maybe you want to have the cake that he cut, just in case you were confused about it as a performance piece. He cut it and then all the children ran out, all the children of the artist ran out and ate the house in a few seconds, or the movie which has the same structure, four descriptions of the different phases followed by all the phases, and there he is in his kind of sweaty glory. I mean, I'm sort of trying to portray him to you as a kind of philosopher king, and you have to look at that and say, okay, sweaty philosopher king, something like this. Um, he then publishes huge uh, 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 assemblages of the photographs from the book, you can buy them, they're meant to be by you, buy them in a gallery, and each of them has the name of the page from the book. So it's a reversal. Instead of a book of an exhibition, you make an exhibition of artwork that was actually representation of what was in the book. Again, tricking you, tricking you, tricking you, and showing you all of the stages. The whole book is sold as, as a collectible limited edition, which you're looking at. Included in that limited edition is a collage that was not in the book, even though it has the name of a page in the book. I think he does that just to see if anybody's noticing. Um, nobody noticed. Right? I've yet to see anybody say, you know, the funny thing about this image is it ain't in the book. He then takes, for example, an image of the book, like you see on the left, and publishes it, actually puts in an exhibition on the right. You see he's chopped the top of it, and it gets exhibited in, a, in an important exhibition. He shows collages that were never seen before. He shows collages of collages. Eventually, color comes out. Then you have, these look the same, but if you look closely, they're different. He's making three or four versions of each of these, so you get a unique collage, which is actually not unique. Then 1975, the color photograph appears of the outside of the house. He's actually there in the, in the, in the bottom right, so you know when you, when, you, when you buy this photograph that it's, you're not buying a photograph by him, but a photograph of him. So the, the, the buyer, the gallerist, the writer doesn't have any problem, and nor should they have any problem with the idea that you can take a photograph by asking someone else to photograph you, even if he, you're not even looking at them. Then he organizes them into sets like this. Then the zebrachrome arrives, so 77 zebrachromes, and we get, the, we get everything re redone. We see him again and again. Now we see the frame of the negative. Like, like this is not a physical performance of the cutting of a house. This is a massive performance of a multimedia. This is a kind of vast layering uh, of media. This is at the very least a media artist in which he's always in the image as the heroic uh, dancer, circus performer, athlete, thrill seeker, boy next door. And the word an architecture is now gone. Like from the moment he said it's not an architecture, this is Germano Chalant again, the person who named the previous work an architecture, 1975, he's the first to publish this image, the word an architecture is gone. From that moment on until Matt Clark's death, nobody ever refers to him as an, ar an architect again. It's like they all got the message, right? But it's tricky. Meanwhile, these photographs, all of them in a certain sense have become famous now. There are 31 of them. We're going up through the house, right? Now we're up the stairs. And the more I show them to the, you, may, you know, you, you're probably starting to get sort of familiar with the house, starting to feel it. And if you knew the house already, you knew it really through these photographs, not through the collages. Ten of these images were already published in that first year, in the first three articles. He chose another ten in the year of his death. And the last ten just arrived after his death never had appeared before. Now we're up looking at the corners. 
Now we're heading up towards the attic. We're in the attic. We're up on the roof. We're looking down from the roof, down through the hole. This set, this kind of mosaic, this is, this is finally the, 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 the project. All of these are presented by him as documentary photographs, not as artworks. He only uses uh, one of these images at the top in one of his collages. In other words, a photograph that he's decided is a documentary photograph is not used in the construction of a collage. And eventually you could discover that some of the black and white images are actually coming from color. Even the one that we first showed you from Laurie Anderson is actually coming off colored image that, that, that sometimes it's not the same image. In fact, in this case, it's the almost identical photograph, color in black and white. Black and color images not seen before. Also, you start to notice that actually photographs that we thought were the same photograph are not the same. These are all different. I could show you another six photographs of this corner. All have been published as if they are the same photograph by experts in photography whose only interest in showing you them is to talk about photography and how photography works. So real experts in photography have levels of blindness uh, that I'm very jealous of. Remember that he, we, he, he even photographed the cut being done and being removed and the piece of the corner being taken down the side of the building and chose the image of it coming down that would be right and the image in the middle, which is the one that he puts in the gallery, photographs him putting it in the truck and there's the truck. Again, do you think there's anything casual about this? I mean, it, you know, you could ask yourself, what is the purpose of this photograph? Now he's near the storage facility where he's going to store them. So when the same photograph appears in the gallery with a cut drawing below, it's part of an unbelievably systematic uh, uh, effort that was already there in this image that you saw. Okay, so very fast, you must be wondering, hopefully wondering, well, what the hell about that show then? You seem to have just let it die. So what did happen in Green Street? If we go into the archives of Matt Clark, we can find a set of 50 mounted photographs. They are 20 by 16. One of the few things that all the people who were in the show that may or may not have happened is that they all say that it involved 20 by 16 black and white photographs with not very many words. And these are the ones we find in the Matt Clark archive. So one way to answer the question, what is an architecture, is just to show you these images. So you are now getting a deep education in an architecture. 50% of the images, there is architecture, but always something's happening to, to it through war or flood or, um, and the other half in which there's no apparent architecture, there's a kind of architecture being uh, constructed. Maybe the most Matter Clark-like images are these three images, and this is the most repeated image, which shows in a way the secrets inside a wall, the kind of congest congested layers of material behind a kind of a white surface, as if showing the secrets, but still you don't know. But you know, half the images on flash art are not in the archive. So either the flash art is not an accurate record of the show or what's in the archive is not a good record of the show. And anyway, they don't match, right? When there are words on the image in the archive, there are not words in flash art. And the reverse, when there's no words in the images in the archive, there's words in flash art. Like was here, there's words on the right. Even when there are words that seem to be in the same place and say the same thing, actually they're different, right? So there's no match. Now, of course, we can go to the archives of Richard Nonus, of Gene Heistein and um, Tina Gerard, and we find these images there from the same set, right? So the, again, you, we're going now deeper into an architecture. Um, I shouldn't have to explain these images to you. They didn't think the images needed to be explained. They thought it shouldn't have many words. By the way, it seemed to be quite a lot of words, right? But these are meant to be sort of self-explanatory images of an architecture. You know, of course, that this is the set from which they may have chosen the ones that they put up, but we don't know how many they chose. But you get a feeling from where they are chosen. This is Laurie Anderson, for example. You get another, another hole in a wall. I more or less know uh, who did which of these images and so on and what their history is, but it doesn't seem to be very interesting in a show that was anonymous. And anyway, hard to imagine that their particular choices of particular images were not affected by other members of the group. We have, for example, Gene Heistein's total violation of the rules by making a vertical collage. Um, and we have the original. And we have the original of, because in the show was that, it would seem, was this plastic, and was an aerogram from Metaclark from Amsterdam saying to the group what, what, the, what, what they think they should do with very precise instructions. And if we look in those instructions, we do find some instructions that match the images. Right, very precisely, things that you've already looked at are kind of specified. But isn't that weird that he would write a letter saying what should be in the an architecture show and they put the letter in the show itself? 
By the way, it's very efficient because if you have a set of architectural ideas and you just exhibit them, well then, hey, you've done the exhibition. Then we could look at prints that are printed at the same time but not mounted, so they didn't even make it to the mounting phase, but maybe we want to know. And would we, would we be less sure of what an architecture is as we go wider and wider, or more sure? In other words, if we put together all these images, we're going to get to about 250 images, and we know there were 12 images in flash art, and we could imagine the show was somewhere between the two, that there's a mosaic of 12 in flash art and a mosaic of 250. Now, if I make the mosaic 300, maybe we learn more about an architecture rather than less, because if an architecture is this kind of multiplying system, so more disasters, more curious architectures produced where you least expect it, more architecture that is architecture, but let's say on the right, the dog changes everything. Right? Again, you'd have your own view of what constitutes architecture. Even if we take the image of the invitation, there are four different versions, everything multiplies. Going back to the, if we go back to the, to the aerogram, very precisely written, Here's the cover of the aerogram. He's basically saying, look, I'm just being crazy. I'm out of control. This is just pouring out of me. I'm drinking tequila. I am, I am. I'm really like loosey-goosey, right? I'm just spontaneous. Well, and he's saying, you guys need to come up with your ideas. Not so spontaneous. This is the draft for the aerogram. Every single line in the aerogram, which is written in precise pen, has been sketched out. And Matterclark never, never writes anything without crossing out. So this is not the original. This is like the clean version of many drafts. So that aerogram is itself a highly elaborate construction full of a series of ideas. Even the rules for how to make the word game are spelled out as a set of rules for the word game. Even the notice that was published in Avalanche saying that the exhibition would happen is totally calculated by Meta Clark and sent to Liza Bear. We can look at the note cards that he was taking at the time. None of the group remember him taking note cards, but these famous note cards, some of them tell us about what an architecture is. And some of them I think are particularly evocative here, a simple manipulation of metaphoric ideas loosely related to a specific category, in this case architecture. So this is a little bit what they were up to. Re-questioning the ideas, not as alternatives to architecture, but as a uh, playful, metaphoric departure from the rigid structures uh, of that tradition. We will have to work together to unravel the unfound. Here is what we have to offer you. It's, not, it's most elaborate form, confusion, guided by a clear sense of purpose. An architecture attempts to solve no problem, but to rejoice in an informed, well-intended celebration of conditions that best describe and locate a place. So it's not architecture, but it is. Originally, I had thought the notion of a special kind of confrontation in mind, but as the differences between the persuasiveness of architecture, pervasiveness of architecture, and the delicate, uh, 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 right? And you say, oh, okay, this is Meta Clark. We can check his handwriting. He's telling us what the project is about. But that would be to treat his words as like explanation. And anybody who would treat Meta Clark's words as explanation is an idiot, right? Not a single person describing Meta Clark will not fail to mention how he was a kind of a poet and one could never fully understand what he was saying. And the idea that his words were like explanation of the work and not the work itself, Laurie Anderson will insist he's, he is a poet and the words are the point. And the cuts and so on are supporting the words. So these would not be explanations of an architecture, these would be artworks that you're looking at. Again, how is it possible for me to show them to you? Right? Architecture, working in several dimensions, making the discussions, I suppose the architecture group, the show, the architecture show, and the work. Keeping it on, keeping it open, keeping it an open process, finishing, just keeping it going and going and going. You start to get a feeling for this. The only photographs we have of a meeting, uh, Gordon is preparing the uh, grass. Richard Nonis is leaning back, Ree Morton is a bit nervous. Everybody's waiting for Gordon to finish the work, he's rolling. He's almost done, he's done. Everybody's happy, um, and the ideas are starting to flow. There is the bottle of tequila there if you watch for it. So it's Ray Morton, Gene Heistein, Susie Harris. Susie Harris, unbelievable, unbelievable person. He's, you know, there's the tequila. Laurie Anderson arrives, but did you notice it's now morning? So this an architecture meeting actually went all night and into the morning. Ray Morton has left, uh, Jeffrey Liu has left, uh, she has arrived, she's now photographing. We see Susie Harris and, and Jean Heistein in deep conversation, it's very lit. You can maybe do sort of forensic work, figure out what was on the table. But in this, I think, most beautiful photograph, she looks down the table towards Matt Clark. He's no longer rolling the chemicals 
for the group. He's no longer loosening the conversation. He's typing it down. He's transferring the discussion. And, and it's as if the light is catching the paper he's writing on, as if some sort of magical product is coming out. And he looks at us like caught in the act, right? Turning the group from the group uh, into something else. But caught also without uh, embarrassment, without uh, and, no, and, and everybody's uh, in a way happy for this, but this is what's happening. It's a real production. And he's imagining what could be in an architecture exhibition, even an exhibition dominated by the idea of no thing works, nothing works, which was specified in the, in the aerogram um, and is specified many, many times. And one of the big cards, these cards done at 20 by 16, as if maybe they would be the show, one of these cards deals with an architecture, cutting somewhere between the supports and collapse, which is also in his first theories, which was also quoted by Jamal Chalan, and is also in the 1975, when explaining this project, it's everywhere. And just to finish then, okay. Uh, getting back to the tree, 1971. You see his drawing on the right? It's, an, it's architecture. He thought he could live here for a month. The idea was to live for a month. Instead, they couldn't do it. All the members of the An Architecture group are there, all of them, in the tree, hanging up there, like spiders in the wind. By the way, if you look at his tree drawings, like this one, you look closely, they're made up of, out of architecture. So you can make an, an architecture in a tree, but the tree is itself made of architecture. It's a kind of a confusion of what is a tree, what is an architecture. The very first written text of the word An Architecture is a letter from Tina Gerard to Matt Clark talking about using a tree and then she sends a postcard of a tree to Anarcho, Anarcho Meta, right? And this tree will be re-photographed for the exhibition and a dead tree. And she will say, we live in dead trees. We could therefore live in any dead tree and proposes that this dead tree is an architecture. She has a series of ideas, psychological scale, dominoes. And then uh, Alan Surratt, the amazing artist, writes from India to Gordon saying, hey, what's going on with your an architecture thing? I look forward to seeing the first written production for an architecture. Some an architecture is required. You need like some architecture, some foundation. Aerophytes live on branches and feed from the air. Oh my, if you'd only get together and discuss things and clarify, that's really good. Really, it seems that talking meaningfully and to see and understand one another is harder even than aerophytes. In other words, you need to sit on architecture in order to get to this thing which is not architecture, right? You, and, you, and it's in a tree that you must sit. And just to go back finally to that bus trip, because now we have the film of the bus trip. Here's the bus. Um, by the way, we live like just there behind the bus. They get in the bus, full of artists and dogs and children of artists, through the tunnel. When they finally meet the house splitting, they meet it, let's say, in the trees, surrounded by trees. And all the views of it have to do with the juxtaposition of the house and the trees and the juxtaposition of the people and the trees in the house. They get up on the roof. Gordon wants to say he's the king of the universe brings everybody up, Richard Nonis, uh, uh, Laurie Hawkinson, up through the crack, sitting on the roof, Gordon going to the very edge, Laurie looking down, but looking where? Looking to the trees, the plants. Again, this kind of confusion of what it means to be in a house that's been cut and to be in a tree. Wegman climbs the tree opposite, and they're directly talking to each other, like tree to tree, house to tree, and then again, looking down through the crack to the tree. So there is this tree thing. It was there, right, in the images that I've been showing you before. It was always there. It's always this play between the trees and the house, a house that could be a tree. It was even there in this image, the more you look at it. The stability of this image was a little bit by the symmetry, that not only of the house, but the symmetry of the trees. And then if you look back at those images, how weird it is the way those trees still left in the image, despite the fact that he's abstracting everything out. Seems like he's abstracting all the trees away. But remember, 1975 comes back, again, the images of the trees. And this is where to finish, not on any kind of dramatic conclusion. But see, even when he writes the word in architecture, he's always stumbling, and architecture and architecture end up on top of each other. My general feeling is something like this. Uh, he's an absolutely amazing uh, sort of inspirational figure, un sort of stunning. Uh, it's hard to think of architecture the same after looking at his work. It's very hard to think of art after, after looking at his work. He's, in that sense, very transformational. He's in and around a concept called an architecture that he actually banned, having embraced it. But it's almost as if him saying, no, not an architecture, feeds that. Literally, the moment he died, his work was then se celebrated as an architecture, an architecture, an architecture. So this word, and I, I suppose I would say, uh, at one level, that's kind of stupid to take a, a word you don't know and work you don't know and put them together as if that will solve the problem. In other words, using a question as an answer rather than as a question. 
On the other hand, I think it shows the kind of genuine curiosity and nervousness that's felt in the face of Metaclaric's work. I think why he's still interesting is that it would not be possible or should not be possible for me to end this lecture on any kind of moment of kind of uh, clarity, um, but kind of back in the trees, you know, where things are uh, uh, unclear. Um, and that's enough. Bye. A couple of questions or a drink, or questions and a drink. Yes, let's go fast. As this kind of lonely, heroic, tragic figure, but then the deep kind of archival homework that you did to, um, uh, to reframe the kind of murky origins of this concept and architecture, it uh, makes me see that uh, collect this idea of collectivity and multiplicity um, was there from the beginning and seems to be an integral part to this concept of an architecture. I was wondering if you could talk about the um, idea of authorship and an architecture, because there also seems to be a kind of hearkening back to surrealism and states of, I mean, maybe they're drunk, but semi-consciousness, not being totally in control of one's um, uh, intentions, as well as this kind of group uh, activity of, and, and also just um, having this kind of flow of free associations um, to create form. Yeah, I, no, thanks for the question. I, I, I don't, as you could tell, I don't think of Matt Clark as a tragic figure. Um, it, it, um, he was haunted by death and um, felt sure that, that he will die, and, and so he was very much in that, in that uh, and he was ill, but, uh, but finally died of something more unexpected. But um, I, I don't see it as tragic. I agree with you completely that it's really, really consistent. In other words, if you look, that's why I was trying to show you the tree dance, that if you look at the tree dance, it's really the same, and you're absolutely right that it's collective. He always insisted that an architecture was a collaborative project, and an architecture was, the reason he says that, I think the reason he says the house is not an architecture is he thought the house was okay and he thought it was good, but an architecture was, was, was meant to be something tr trickier. What he says is, okay, the African-American family that lives in that house was imprisoned in that house and uh, imprisoned in an economic system that will always uh, neglect them. And he was very, very articulate uh, a political thinker, but he, he would always say and said in every interview, but don't for a minute think that a rich person in a rich suburban house is not any less a prisoner. We are all prisoners because we believe that the houses around us contain us, and so the purpose of his work is to sort of show that actually it's not so difficult to sort of undo it. So it's collaborative in a double sense, in the sense that it should be something done together, but it's also something that would, by definition, um, uh, sort of undo the differences between people and re 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 reconnect people. In terms of surrealism, I mean, he, again, I'm the wrong, you shouldn't ask me like I would be like saying something grand about surrealism. When he himself asked, he said like, well, what's your relationship with Duchamp and so on? He would say, well, he was French. So he had, you know, he, had, he was able to be like very clear about these things. Of course, I'm very influenced by data, but I can't myself tell you exactly the nature of that influence. In other words, he's a very articulate guy, trained at the Sorbonne as well as, uh, um, um, Cornell, uh, in a kind of traumatic, t which is to say normal relationship with his father, um, and, and, you know, a, a, a leading surrealist. So um, he's like, you know, Oedipus times 400, or rather his father, because that's the point of the Oedipus story, his father is Oedipus times 100. So he's in the middle of a drama, but, but to call it tragic seems to be, a, to be a mistake. Much better, it seems to me, to simply celebrate um, a kind of astonishing, multi-dimensional, and always collaborative work. But it just seems to me in the nature of collaborations that individuals are the products of collaborations. Like this is one of the paradoxes. So he, 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 he when people talk about the An Architecture Group show, they only think of, of him. Um, m big mistake, right? So I'm not answering your question very well, but um, on the alcohol, because um, I've made a bit of a theme of that, um, friends of his say that he was really drinking that tequila because he had these huge stomach issues. And these stomach issues would be what would kill him in the end. 
So it was really an anesthetic. It was not about uh, drunkenness. Uh, all sorts of other chemicals were being used at that time by everybody. So this was not the kind of point. I don't think in, in, in any of that work I see a kind of desire to get to the unconscious in the surrealist sense. It was really about an amazing um, sort of, uh, they were more like dancers. They were doing a very intimate dance and alcohol was part of like removing barriers and they were exploring. And this, this, I think, was the model. I, had, I don't think they had anything kind of weird that they wanted to dig up in the unconscious. They thought that the world they saw in front of them, like New York City, was as weird as shit. And the question was how to uh, work with it. So all of them get out of the gallery and try to work with the city itself. So in some senses, I think it was kind of anti-surrealist in, 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 in that sense. But, I, you know, I, I'm, what do I know? One more question. Thank you very much. This, it's an incredibly fascinating and it's a fascinating take and I agree with you that there's a lot on Mata Clark and 99% of it is tough to brave. And just the care and precision of your scholarship brings, brings things to light that I just don't think have. I was really struck by the coincidence of, of Smithson's death around the publication of the announcement of the Unarchitecture show and I wonder if actually that cast a pale over the event in one way. So to one side of the event, that question. On the, on the other, could you talk a little bit about food? And I'm wondering in particular if chronologically or in terms of the group, there, uh, there's overlap there, and if in a certain sense an architecture becomes more of a dispersal than a, than a, turn, than, than a, than a kind of hinge uh, uh, for that group. All right, I, I love your question. Uh, yes, I, I think I was almost saying that, but I think you said better. I do think an architecture is a dispersal, is a concept of dispersal. Um, in terms of food, for, for those of you who don't know, food, food is, a, is, a, is a kind of collaborative restaurant that was set up in uh, Soho, mainly by uh, Carol Gooden, who was the partner of, of um, Meta Clark, but also Tina Gerard and the, and the others. And essentially the idea was to have a kind of a kitchen in which artists would make the food and artists would eat the food or anybody. It was a, it was a concept of hospitality and also of enormous inventiveness. So, so Meta Clark was like social to the core and if food is the, is the sort, of, um, sort of engineer's conversation, um, food also was thought to be, let's say, one of the headquarters, one of the kind of uh, key spots where artists would discuss art and discuss the future. So when, he, when the first cut he does in food, 1971, is this very simple square, I think he doesn't show it because it's a particularly interesting cut. In fact, it's super not an interesting cut. I think it has to do with this point you're making. It's a, it's a matter of uh, point, pointing to food itself and the kind of concept of... Uh, uh, of food. It, it would seem, I mean, I, I don't know whether to be loved is like a good thing or not, um, but it would seem that almost everybody that met him really loved him. I mean, he was um, somebody that wanted to be loved and had this ability, and I think the food thing cre created this kind of atmosphere. Some have argued that an architecture meetings took place there. Some have argued that the invitation card is photographed there. I think it's not. The furniture is, is, is not, not from there. Um, but food was, um, by definition, a kind of extreme collaboration point of view. Um, for Meta Clark, uh, food was also an artwork, unam unambiguously an artwork, not an artwork you could put in a gallery, but a kind of gallery made of artists eating. And, and we, I went past very, very fast, but Tina Gerard's artwork involved inviting artist friends to come into her apartment in Chatham Square and do one piece of the room. So it's, an, it's a regular apartment with all these things like kitchens and tables and so on, but every element has been made by an artist and not made to be like, oh great, an interesting artwork, but just a sort of thoughtful piece. So I think at that time there was a, a kind of research within the an architecture group on domesticity. And rem remember they say a catalog of not art, not architecture, living spaces. So I think food was was a food itself was an artwork, with domesticity as its kind of a, a, a theme. Um, but um, I also think I, I I know people that know so much more about it than me, and I'm really afraid to sort of trample on f food. I think it's a, you know, if you take it, an, an artist like uh, 
Rickwood Trevenaro, for example, he's really basing almost his entire career on that move of metaclaric and food. So it's, just, it's, just, it's really astonishing how um, metaclaric has, is just sort of like uh, somebody that really inspires creative work by other people. So it's social, and for me this is another kind of social, social life, but it's also another kind of dispersal. So this is why, again, I don't think it's a tragedy. Yes, he dies very young. Yes, he's doing just 10 years of work. But 10 years of work of, of a kind of coherence that is really uh, uh, astonishing and, 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 and magical. He himself uh, dies, from, from all accounts, with an extraordinary dignity and, and sense of having accomplished what he wanted to accomplish. So the kind of opposite, a, a very Buddhist uh, ending. So I don't see any reason to uh, feel sad for Matt Clark. I do see the need uh, to drink um, in his honor. So that would be my suggestion of what we should do next.